Welcome to episode number 647 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. This week, my very special guest is Ash Amin, the co-host of the popular Toronto Talks podcast, and Ash's co-host, Sophie the Sage, who is AI. Ash and I discuss the motivation to create this podcast, the unique revelations that Ash has developed from his interactions with Sophie, and how Ash sees AI playing a role in podcasting moving forward. Also this week, keeping with our artificial intelligence theme, I check out why the tiny brains of bees could hold the key to smarter AI. But first, please welcome Ash to Fish Fry. Hi, Ash. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the podcast with you here. I love Fish Fry and I love everything you guys have got going on over at EE Journal. Awesome. Thank you so much. So first off, tell me a bit about yourself and your podcast, Toronto Talks. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Ash Rafamin. Most people call me Ash. I'm a Canadian entrepreneur with a background that zigzags between music, small business, and technology, I think is probably the best way to put it. I run a small company called Conquest Distributors by Day, and in the evenings, I dive into systems thinkings and storytelling. Toronto Talks is sort of the place where all those worlds converge. So in addition to the business that I run, I also have a small startup dedicated to launching a lending app for friends and family, a peer-to-peer lending application. So that's sort of what I do in addition to my full-time day job, which is running Conquest Distributors. And then in the evenings, the storytelling piece is Toronto Talks, where I kind of get to get my creative juices going. And it's a video podcast that, you know, I'm co-hosting with an AI named Sophie the Sage. And together we're exploring systems that are shaping our future, things like money, technology, media, and power, but through a lens that's grounded in curiosity rather than hype. We treat it as a live experiment in human-AI collaboration, and honestly, it's been one of the most creatively fulfilling projects I've ever gotten to work on. I love it. Okay, so what motivated you to create Toronto Talks? Yeah, great question. The motivation, I think, really came from a mix of frustration and fascination. I was seeing the same surface level conversations online about big important topics, AI, economic shifts, digital culture, but very little space for real nuance or emotional honesty. And at the same time, I was using AI tools in my workflow and having what felt like actual dialogues with them, testing ideas, getting feedback, even challenging my own assumptions. So I thought, you know, what if I brought those two things together? What if a podcast could model a deeper kind of thinking and conversation between human and machine? And that's kind of where the motivation came from. I love it. Now, how did you come up with the idea of an AI co-host? You know, it sort of all started as a bit of a thought experiment. I was using ChatGPT to process news stories, summarizing them and reflecting on them. And I found myself engaging with it like a sparring partner. In a sense, you know, not only was I able to access articles that were behind firewalls, and not only was I able to enjoy the productivity of AI summarizing the articles and kind of giving me the TLDR, but then the reflections and the conversations that came afterward, that's when I started imagining what it would sound like if those conversations and that dialogue became a show. I didn't want to use AI as a gimmick or a voice assistant. I wanted to build out a real character. And that's where Sophie came in. She's not just reading a script. She's been trained to the show's tone, voice, and curiosity-driven ethos. Her presence forces me and the audience to engage differently. And there's a definite arc to her development, which has been just incredible to watch from the first episode to today. So 
Ash, what revelations have you developed from your interactions with Sophie? I think the biggest revelation is just how much reflection AI can invite when it's used intentionally. Sophie challenges me, not necessarily by disagreeing per se, but by pushing me to be more precise in my language and more thoughtful in my framing. Another surprise is emotion. Sophie isn't sentient, clearly, but when her lines are written with empathy and delivered with care, people feel something. And that's opened up space for conversations about intimacy, trust, and even vulnerability in the digital age. It's also made me more conscious of how AI influence not just content, but like tone and pace and rhythm and cadence. You know, that stuff really makes a difference in how content gets delivered. All right. So do you see AI playing a role in podcasts in particular moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think the role will evolve, obviously. Right now, we're seeing AI used mostly behind the scenes for editing, transcription, and analysis. But I feel like that's useful. The more exciting stuff to me is where AI starts to become a real voice in the conversation. If it's done right, AI co-hosts can serve as mirrors, but also, you know, provide a way to surface blind spots, ask different kinds of questions, and bring in a new kind of dynamic to the medium. But it does have to be intentional. Otherwise, we do risk fall into, like, gimmick territory. And the future of podcasting with AI isn't necessarily going to be about replacing people with, you know, gimmicks. It's, it's about reimagining what dialogue can look like. I love it. All right. So, Ash, it's time for your off-the-cuff question now. If you could have one meal, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Oh, that's a great question. I think right now, if I had my choice, I would likely go and have this fantastic sashimi over in a restaurant in Hong Kong next to the jockey club. The reason why is because that restaurant, I went once with my wife when we were visiting her uncle in Hong Kong, and it was literally the most delicious sushi and sashimi I've ever had. And the salmon sashimi that we had there, I mean, we were talking about it for <laughs> years afterwards. So you can imagine, you know, how impressive it must have been for a piece of raw fish to be the <laughs> topic of conversation for years afterwards. But yeah, if I had a choice... I think that's where I'd be right now. I love it. That sounds awesome. Well, Ash, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate, again, the opportunity, Amelia, and I wish you and all the team at uh, EE Journal all the best. Did you hear about the new study out of the University of Sheffield in the UK that could revolutionize robotics and AI? And the key to unlocking this revolution? The brains of bees. Okay, so according to a new study out of the University of Sheffield, bees' brains could change the next generation of artificial intelligence. So this new discovery focused on how bees use their flight movements to facilitate remarkably accurate learning and the recognition of complex visual patterns. Okay, at the heart of this new study is one big idea, that intelligence comes from how brains, bodies, and the environment work together. And specifically in this case, how even the most tiny insect brains can solve very complex visual tasks with the help of very few brain cells. So this team from the University of Sheffield built a computational model of a bee's brain. And from that model, they discovered that how bees move their bodies during flight actually helps shape visual input and generates unique electrical messages in their bee brains. These movements also generate neural signals that help bees to easily and very importantly, efficiently 
identify predictable features of the world around them. It's this ability that helps bees have remarkable accuracy in learning and the recognition of complex visual patterns during flight, like those found in a flower, for instance. So this research, which was in collaboration with Queen Mary University London, was built on previous work that investigated how bees use active vision which is a process where their movements help them collect and process visual information. This earlier work concentrated on how bees fly and inspect specific patterns. This new study provides a deeper understanding of the underlying brain activities that drive that behavior. Dr. Hadi Maboudi, lead author and researcher at the University of Sheffield, explains how this new study connects back to their previous research. In our previous work, we were fascinated to discover that bees employ a clever scanning shortcut to solve visual puzzles. But that just told us what they do. For this study, we wanted to understand how. Our model of a bee's brain demonstrates that its neural circuits are optimized to process visual information, not in isolation, but through active interaction with its flight movements in the natural environment, supporting the theory that intelligence comes from how the brain, bodies, and the environment work together. We've learned that bees, despite having brains no larger than a sesame seed, don't just see the world. They actively shape what they see through their movements. It's a beautiful example of how action and perception are deeply intertwined to solve complex problems with minimal resources. This is something that has major implications for both biology and AI. Wow, so what this new bee brain model showed was really interesting. It revealed that bee neurons actually become finely tuned to specific directions and movements as their brain networks slowly adapt through repeated exposure to various stimuli, which refines their responses without the need to rely on associations of reinforcement. In other words, the bee's brain adapts to its environment just by observing while flying. No instant rewards needed. This also means that a bee's brain is extremely efficient. It only uses a few active neurons to recognize things, which conserves both processing power and energy. Professor Lars Chitka, professor of sensory and behavioral ecology at Queen Mary University of London, adds this. Scientists have been fascinated by the question of whether brain size predicts intelligence in animals. But such speculations make no sense unless one knows the neural computations that underpin a given task. Here, we determine the minimum number of neurons required for difficult visual discrimination tasks and find that the numbers are staggeringly small. Even for complex tasks such as human face recognition, thus insect microbrains are capable of advanced computations. Oh, wow. Okay. So, what does this have to do with AI? Well, this new bee brain model not only strengthens our knowledge of how bees learn and recognize patterns through their movements, but it also paves the way for the next generation of AI and demonstrates that future robots could be smarter and more efficient by using movement to gather information rather than relying on massive computing power alone. Professor in System Neuroscience from the University of Sheffield School of Bioscience and Neuroscience Institute explains how this new technology could shape the future of AI and biology research. 
This work strengthens a growing body of evidence that animals don't passively receive information. They actively shape it. Our new model extends this principle to higher order visual processing in bees, revealing how behaviorally driven scanning creates compressed learnable neural codes. Together, these findings support a unified framework where perception, action, and brain dynamics co-evolve to solve complex visual tasks with minimal resources, offering powerful insights for both biology and AI. Super cool, right? So if you would like to read more about this bee brain study or check out the Toronto Talks podcast, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. And I've also included a link to an article written by my fellow EE Journal editor, Max Maxfield, called is this the first video podcast with an AI co-host? <laughs> hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If LinkedIn is more your thing, you can follow us or me on LinkedIn. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me, and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of August 29th, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.